The number one thing that, uh, Stott, you mentioned at the very beginning when you were doing your preamble, the number one thing that stops being pro from people as being successful, whether a career-minded person, individual contributor, executive, entrepreneur, you name it, the number one thing is your mindset and what you say to yourself every single day. And if we could just get people to remind themselves that they're amazing, they're awesome, they're learning, they're practicing, they're getting better, and to build themselves up and work in their mindset, we would have better entrepreneurs, better executives, better fathers, better mothers, better kids all around the world by just starting there. All right, ready to have some fun? Let's do it, dude. Let's rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone has goals. Now, they may be minor and outwardly insignificant to the rest of the world, or they might be huge and, and frankly, nearly impossible to accomplish. Now, the single thread that holds all these things and all these goals together is accountability. Today, we've got Don Marklin. He is the CEO and founder of Accountability Now. Now, Don, take a minute and share with us and share with the audience why accountability is really propelling us forward or, frankly, holding us back. Dustin, I love that question. And uh, as I'm going to answer that, I just want to tell you how much I love your podcast and, and the you. voice you provide for so many people. When I started my first business, we didn't have podcasts to listen to to give us insight, right? <laughs> we were going to the library and talking to people. And so I, if I could go back into DeLorean uh, 17 years, I would have been listening to stuff like this. So thank oh, you for that. I appreciate it. Thanks, and, and to address your question, right, about accountability, so many times people misunderstand that word. They think accountability is this, you know, and you hear it, or did you hold them accountable? Did you, it's right. always in response to a negative behavior. And where I teach is accountability is not negative. It's always positive, always. It always propels us forward. And accountability is simply um, measuring, reporting, and pushing forward, doing what you said you're going to do, right? In the most simplest terms. And I'll give you an example. Like you don't have to think to breathe. You breathe every single day, right? right? And breathing is what pushes you forward. Accountability is the same thing in a business as people are not just quote held accountable for when they make mistakes, but they're held accountable when they crush it, when they're held accountable, when they do things well, the networker the, or the network engineer, the guy that's got probably the worst job in a business, nobody's ever calling that guy and saying, man, thank you for email working today. <laughs> thank you for uptime today. They're not, yeah. they only want to hold them accountable when they're down. And I teach organizations all over the world Hold people accountable for mm -hmm. every win, no matter how small. And I want you to hold as much intensity on if somebody does well, you saying, did you hold them accountable for that victory yeah. as you would when they make a mistake and your business will change. That's awesome. You know, actually, I, I love that you have the, the four C's. And, and I, first thing I want to talk about is you have two basic rules when we, before we get into the four C's. And, and number one, I think it's, it, it's accountability always starts with me, the individual. And the second rule you got there is there's no eagles, uh, no eagles, no birds in accountability, by the way, no yeah. egos in accountability. I mean, walk us through, because it sounds like that's really what you're setting the stage for, that there's no egos. You have to do it. And it, it's not always bad. That's right. So the, when I teach the second rule, there's no egos. I teach it um, with a metaphor with baseball in, in the U.S. A lot. Of, I always have to say in the U.S. because I have a lot of international <laughs> clients. In the U.S., we have this sport, baseball. And you can see I have this Mets cap on right here, a big mm -hmm. fan of baseball. And in baseball, if I throw a pitch and a person swings and they miss, that's a strike. Right. And it doesn't matter if the umpire called it a strike or if the opposing player called the strike or fan stands called it a strike. It's always a strike. But so many times we get so bent out of shape when somebody calls us on something, yeah. whether they're our employee or a janitor or somebody or a spouse and they call us out, we get all bent out of shape saying, hey, it's not your job to say where I messed up. Or we try to deflect and say, well, you do it too. You're a hypocrite. Well, no crap. They're a hypocrite. Every one of us are not perfect, but that doesn't mean it still wasn't a strike. That doesn't mean you still didn't miss. Mm -hmm. Drop the ego and remember anybody can hold you accountable. Anybody. I don't care if it's a five-year-old on the street that points out, hey, you, sir, you missed that. That was a bad sales pitch. If it was a bad sales pitch, own it and improve. That's awesome. Now, so I guess real quick about those four C's. I think this is, and I love the framework you have. That's critique success, correct failure, celebrate growth, and then crush mediocrity. I mean, how do you critique success? If I'm winning, if I've won the championship, like really what is there to critique? 
I love that. I, that's a great example. People ask me that all the time because they want to break their wrist, patting themselves on the back <laughs> because they did something really well. But I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at just sports and you see how few times back-to-back championships have happened in all of sports, even though the same team stayed together. Yeah. And the reason why is because they're too spending too much time celebrating rather than going <laughs> right back to the training room and acting like they lost. Yep. And so I tell people, regardless of what you've done, before you go celebrate, before you go pop the cork, before you do any of that stuff, is to stop and critique, surround yourself with people and say, okay, if this, if we had a 460 foot home run, how do we hit 461 next time? Mm-hmm. I don't want, there's this mentality that people say, do it perfect every time, do it. And I get rid of that because nobody's perfect, but I want you to do it better every time, whatever it is, stop and figure out how we can do it better. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of companies just don't do that, whether it's an individual entrepreneur, whether it's a big organization, you know, how can we do this better? Because frankly, the competition is not going to wait for you to figure that part out. They're going to leapfrog. Yeah. So I mean, you're absolutely right. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was saying, I mean, you know, speaking of, speaking of leapfrogging, I mean, you started your career at 18 doing outside telesales. I mean, a very glorious job, you know, everybody's dream job. I mean, how do you go from there? to CRO, COO, you know, global head of sales and marketing. I mean, there has to be some leapfrogging in there. I mean, how does that happen for you as a person? Um, so it, I love that you asked that question. I remember being that phone rep on the and just calling and, get, you know, I was that guy that interrupted you during dinner or your family. <laughs> and I was trying to sell like little membership clubs and different things at the time. And here I was 18 years old. And after I'd been on the phones for two weeks, an yeah. opening came for a supervisor position. Okay. And so I went and applied for it. And I remember all my friends around me were saying, Don, you're crazy. You're 18. <laughs> you have no business. You've only been here two weeks. Yeah. And I remember telling them, you don't know me. And yeah. I went and put together back at the time, we didn't have PowerPoint, but I went together this little presentation and I showed my manager, her name was Kim Clegg. And I showed mm-hmm. her why I was going to be the best supervisor in the history of the company, in the history of the world. <laughs> and was crazy enough as it, because I stayed at it and was confident I got the job. Yeah. And I became awesome. a manager at 18. And then I kept doing that. I There was a about a year later, a, a whole call center manager position opened up in Washington State. And I went and applied for it. And again, everybody told me, Don, you're crazy. You can't do that. That's for 40-year-olds. That's all this <laughs> stuff. And here I was, 19 years old. I drove up to Salt Lake City and I met with the vice president and showed him why I was going to be the best manager in the history of the world. <laughs> and I got the job. And that whole concept that they always joke about, the Michael Scott quote of you miss 100% of the shots you don't take by Wayne Gretzky, by Michael Scott, (laughs) that that meme, that's absolutely true. I kept going after it and going Mm -hmm. after it. And every time people told me no, they told me I'd never be a Forbes contributor, which I beat. They told me I'd never run my own business, which I beat. And you just stay at it. You can't beat somebody that won't give up. That's a Babe Ruth quote. Mm -hmm. And if you just stay at it, you'll always win. You can't beat somebody that won't give up. That's amazing. So, you yeah. know, going back to that sales job and all the other jobs you've had, I mean, yeah. how does sales solve all sins? That's my favorite quote. Mm-hmm. When I go to work with businesses as a consultant or a coach, we always start with sales. Even if they bring me on for an operations fix, or an HR fix, whatever it is, we always start with sales because every business in the world from hospitals to writers to dancing companies to home services, if you sell more, every other problem is manageable. When you're not selling, then all of a sudden you have cash pressure. You have the, you can't cut or cash manage your way to prosperity. You have to sell more. And so we always get that process right first and everything else starts to take care of itself. One of my favorite mentors, this guy named Tom, he always would, when he would take over a business, he would say, look, people want to know if I play favorites. I absolutely do. <laughs> the salespeople are my favorite and they get whatever they want. Mm-hmm. And I, I've always taken that mentality, treat your salespeople right, grow your business, and then every problem becomes manageable. So, I mean, of course, I mean, everybody wants to work for that boss who just loves salespeople, but the, the fact is sales is hard. I mean, that job yeah. itself is hard. Can anybody do it? I mean, can I just go grab somebody and train them and coach them to be an awesome sales guy, the, the next Don Markle? Yeah, well, no one can be the next Don yeah, Mark, yeah, yeah. even though my <laughs> wife would hate that I said that. But to your point, can anybody do sales? Can anybody learn to love sales? The easy answer is yes, mm-hmm. because it can. Selling is a particular set of skills that you practice and train and practice mm-hmm. and train. And I've seen introverts be great salespeople. I've seen extroverts mm-hmm. be great salespeople because they learn how. It's too many times people confuse confidence 
with inability. And confidence is something you gain as you train it. Like for example, Dustin, when you first, your very first episode of a podcast, you were probably way nervous Mm -hmm. and you didn't do it nearly as well as you do now Mm -hmm. because you're just practiced. And so you, you, the reason I'm good on the phone is because I've made thousands of phone calls, (laughs) right? And other people, and I work with coaches all over the world that are always like, Don, I don't want to call somebody. I'm not good at that. I'm an introvert. And I tell them that's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with introvertedness. It has to do with your lack of practice. Pick up the phone. Let's call them and start getting practiced and good. That's awesome, Don. You know, Don, actually, you said a cut, you name dropped a couple people there. And and it sounds like you've had, you've been very fortunate to have some great coaches and mentors along the way. And I wish, and I hope everybody does. You know, you actually wrote an article in Forbes, um, you know, 22nd of February in in 22, um, where you talk about a coach and you talk about how Ted Lasso, is actually a great example of leadership of where so i mean why should business owners why should leaders go watch the show i mean what are the three things that you really point out so the the ted lasso show and if anybody's not familiar with it it's a mm-hmm. show on apple plus it's won a lot of emmys it stars jason sudeikis and it's really kind of a, an exceptional show in the fact that it's all about kindness these are the three things i talked about it's about kindness forgiveness and attention And there are a lot of quotes that people love to use from Ted Lasso, like be a goldfish and these things that are very popular. Mm -hmm. But I found the themes of the show that are not as present in today's business. And boy, if there's ever a time to practice um, forgiveness and kindness and attention, it's right now with some of the turmoil that's going on in the world over the last couple of days in Eastern Europe. It's a great reminder that we as leaders, we as individuals need to practice kindness more than anything else, forgiveness constantly. And if you're trying to improve any relationship in your life, it always comes with attention, time and attention. If I want a better relationship with my wife, spend time with her. I want a better relationship with my employees, spend time with them yes. and ever, it always gets better. And that makes going 100%. I mean, and, and there are a lot of crazy things going on now. And I think, as you mentioned, kindness, forgiveness, that really goes a long way these days. Um, yeah. You know, so kind of going back to those coaches, I mean, you know, there are certain people in our lives, whether it's a boss, whether, even if it's a, you know, a subordinate or something like that, someone that works on our team that we manage. I mean, what's the importance for coaches to really have accountability down to where not not only do they exemplify it, but where they resonate with the rest of their team. Why are coaches so important? So a coach, and this is a great this is a great concept. We you know I'm lucky enough with accountability now. We coach. We have programs that work with coaches all over the world. And last year we worked with 1,100 coaches Jeez. in the last year, helping right. them build their practice and six figure and seven figure practices, and it's been really great. But the one thing we always remind coaches, right, is that people should have a love-hate relationship with (laughs) their coach, right? Everybody wants to be liked and they want to feel good and be liked. But a coach, you should have a love-hate relationship with your coach because they're always finding what makes you uncomfortable next, Mm -hmm. always. If you go take some of the greatest sports coaches in history, I'll give you a perfect example of Nick Saban with Alabama. Players all the time have come out and said those four years under Nick Saban was miserable, Curtis but Lyle. I am a, uh, yeah, but I'm in the NFL making millions because of that. Right. And so you, that's a coach's role, whether it's a hired coach, like a professional coach, like myself or others or internal, where you mm. have people that act as coaches, your job is not to be their friend. Your job is to find what makes them uncomfortable next and push them to get there. Yeah. No, I mean, again, I mean, and I love you brought that because I agree. I mean, coaches, like I said, growth happens in the margins. I mean, like when you're uncomfortable, but not painfully hurting type thing, I mean, that's where you're going to grow. I mean, whether it's personally, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, if you're lifting weights, whatever, that's where growth happens. And, and, you know, and I think when I, I mean, I work with executives and and businesses every single week. And what I think I I feel like just communication is such a, it's difficult. I mean, I feel like that's where a lot of the, you know, the issues really happen and where it breaks down. I mean, you've been a chief revenue officer. You've been a chief operating officer, global head, you know, of sales and marketing VP. I mean, all these awesome titles. How does the leadership at the top really focus on driving accountability, driving communication, driving success in their organization? You know, as you ask that, in a lot of ways, it goes back to what we talked to with Ted Lasso, right? Because If the the three things I talked about of kindness, forgiveness, and attention, if you think about kindness, Mm -hmm. the tone and the way that you speak makes a huge difference. And when you're, I know you do this, Dustin, when you're working with executives, say sometimes forget about the weight that Mm -hmm. their language 
has with employees, especially all the way down. Mm-hmm. They'll speak a certain way. They'll have a certain tone. They're like, well, that's just, I'm a leader. This, this is just my <laughs> way. And their tone has massive impacts. My number one article that I've written in all of Forbes mm-hmm. was the 5.5 reasons you might have a toxic boss or a bully <laughs> boss is what I called it. And people don't realize, especially executives, that the way they speak They might be saying the exact right thing, but the tone in which they do it or the volume in which they do it Mm. has a massive impact on the way people hear it. And that's where kindness comes in. You have to understand the weight of your language, Mm. but then you take the other things of, you know, forgiveness and attention. That's all about consistency, right? Giving them the time and being overly communicative. It's, it's an important lesson to learn and it makes, it makes every business run. I'll say one last thing you mentioned about communication when you do surveys about the number one problem facing an organization, communication is the number one problem almost every single time, even for companies that work on it. (laughs) So give yourself a pass. No, you're not good at it. And you're always striving to get better. Yeah. Well, speaking of communication, you know, this has been awesome. Um, And I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got a client call right after here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, I mean, speaking of communication, I mean, what's that one question? I mean, what is that one thing that I did not ask you today, Don, that that your that my audience and, and your team needs to hear that they need to know about the things that you're doing. The number one thing that uh, stop you mentioned at the very beginning when you were doing your preamble, the number one thing that stops being pro- from people as being successful, whether a career minded person, individual contributor, executive, entrepreneur, you name it. The number one thing is your mindset and what you say to yourself every single day. And I am confident your listeners, most of them beat themselves up and I could probably lock them up for abuse (laughs) by the things they say to themselves about themselves. And if we could just get people to remind themselves that they're amazing, they're awesome, they're learning, they're practicing, they're getting better and to build themselves up and work in their mindset, we would have better entrepreneurs, better executives, better fathers, better mothers, better kids all around the world by just starting there. And you don't need Don Marklin to fix your mindset. Right, we do some of that stuff, but you just need to surround yourself with people like yourself, Dustin, and others that push them to be better and encourage them, and the world will be better. That's awesome. So you work with businesses around the world. You said you've worked with eleven hundred coaches since this past year. If I'm a coach, if I'm an executive leader, if I am somebody that needs to work on something like we talked about today, how do they get in touch with you, Don? What's the best way? Uh, there's two ways. First of all, you can follow me on Instagram, executivecoach.don. Um, and that, that'll follow my content. You can message me there or you can go to my website. You can just go to donmarklin.com. It's real easy. It's after my name and that'll take you to all of the things that we're doing with companies all over the world as well as all the podcasts and groups that we're on. We just got back from a big three-day seminar in Dubai where we helped 450 uh, sales leaders from Russia, Ukraine, and all over Eastern Europe. And they are building their businesses and we do stuff like that all over the world. That's awesome. Well, as you mentioned, a lot of it is tone and communication go. So about 80%, 90% is body language, is body tone. So with a humble heart tone, really just want to say thank you so much for your time today. This was awesome. And I know our audience is going to love it. Don, thank you so much for, for walking us through how accountability definitely ain't easy, but it's worth it. Don, thanks so much, sir. Thank you, Dustin. Great work. Love your podcast. All right. Thanks, sir. Take care.